Okay, so we have the next talk by um, Pete Beckman. Uh, he's going to be speaking online, so it's a remote talk, a remote presentation. Um, can he hear us already? Yes, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me this today. Yes, we can hear you, um, so you're welcome. So please go for it. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, uh, I uh, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, uh, remotely. Uh, I apologize that the uh, uh, travel didn't work out for me this time to make it, but uh, I hope that we have a lot of time for questions. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll uh, get started here. There, can you see everything? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I work at uh, Argonne National Lab and Northwestern University uh, in the United States, and this, uh, this, this talk is actually quite similar to the previous talk, uh, and it's great that we were in the same session here, uh, but instead of looking up at the sky, the project that I'll be talking about today is looking down at the Earth. Uh, and so it has a similar architecture, and let's uh, dive in and get started. This is uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. And uh, just like the SKA, uh, there are uh, distributed uh, sensor networks, distributed monitoring stations around the world. Uh, this is one from uh, the NEON project in the United States. And again, rather than looking up at the sky, this project is looking down at the flora and fauna and what is happening on our planet, uh, on Earth, especially in light of climate change. So this is um, like a tower that was described for SKA. And on the right-hand side are all the instruments that are looking at the atmosphere, looking at solar radiation, and looking down at the grass and at uh, the plants. And in that small little uh, box in the middle of the screen is an instrument hut that can support uh, local, not a correlator, but local processing. And so uh, if we look at this from a, a perspective that says we really are now designing computation that goes from the edge to the cloud. So we have sensors at the edge, like a radio telescope or like an IoT device, and then we have processing that happens in the central data center. But what is missing in terms of our computational capability is what was described is we need to move computation all the way out to the instrument. And we refer to that as, uh, as edge computing. So it allows us to analyze the full resolution data because we'd never be able to send all the data to the HPC center. So we can start an analysis right there at the instrument. So in the space of looking down at our planet, there are many instruments that fall into this kind of category, um, not the large radio telescopes, but rather uh, the kind of instruments that are able to measure our local atmosphere and our local conditions, LIDAR, uh, software-defined radios, hyperspectral imaging, uh, radar, uh, cameras. And so by processing that with AI, where we've done the training at the data center, right, at the supercomputer, and then send back a model that goes out to the edge, now we could process that data in real time uh, and get new insights. And so uh, there are several reasons for this. Uh, of course, one that was uh, mentioned earlier, and it's very obvious, is sometimes you have more data than bandwidth. This is the case with pretty much every instrument now. You can gather more data, you can look at more data at the edge than you could possibly send home, even with the best of networks. Uh, and so, uh, there's a reason to be out computing at the edge because you have that much data, but also latency is important. Sometimes you have to do actuation or make a response and you can't wait for data to go to a cloud and back. In the city where some of our um, uh, experiments are done, there also are privacy concerns. We'd like to throw away all the data and just be able to look at uh, analysis like pedestrian or car traffic without actually taking pictures of cars and pedestrians and sending it home. Uh, resilience is another great reason, uh, like described with the SKA, you know, if you lose one telescope, the rest are still up. Uh, for us, uh, being able to distribute that processing across all the nodes uh, improves uh, resilience. 
And finally, there's also a power uh, advantage to doing it this way. Uh, you can do quiet observation uh, and uh, then only transmit when an interesting event happens. So we've been uh, in this path here for almost 10 years, starting with a small group of students and now with a fairly large group of students uh, and, and uh, programmers and scientists working on algorithms for moving that computation out to the edge, uh, specifically for the kinds of environmental and climate science and earth system science uh, that uh, we're interested in. And so uh, this is the team. Uh, we have uh, Nicola uh, Ferrier and Scott Collis and Ilke Altentis uh, um, uh, and others, Dan Reed, Jim Olds, a very uh, um, uh, fantastic team to be working with. And that team then has been designing this instrument, this uh, capability to distribute computation across the United States in these sites where there are instruments uh, or instrument towers or uh, infrastructure. So our goals are, are straightforward, um, is to build this cyber infrastructure, this computing continuum that goes end to end. So there's a software component, but there's also a small hardware component that some of sometimes those servers don't fit in a hut and they need to be mounted outside. And so there's a small uh, bit of engineering that's required for that. We also want to use all the standard software packages. So PyTorch, OpenCV, TensorFlow, Kubernetes, all those things that scientists are using now on the supercomputer, we want to make that available to run at the in the small at the edge. So that sometimes is referred to as a cloud everywhere strategy so that you can use those tool sets everywhere. And of course, we're deploying this into a real test bed uh, in the United States. So we sometimes refer to this as a software defined sensor. And what we mean by that is that by running computation that a scientist sends out to the edge. So a student might design a new computation that can detect one plant species from another. This is a real uh, experiment that was done several years ago, looking at a green roof on a, uh, uh, on a building. And the uh, scientists wanted to look down and understand the various growing rates of two species of plants based on what's happening in the environment. So they've written a piece of code that becomes a sensor. So they can write a piece of code, scientists can write pieces of code that go out to the edge it defines a new kind of sensor. So I wanna sense birds or I wanna sense wildfire. So that software-based defined sensor is something that anybody can write uh, using the standard tool sets. And then the system software that crosses and goes across the entire computing continuum is what allows us to ship that out there and run that in a container. As I mentioned, there are really two methods for this. So there is a, uh, a time where you can put a rack mounted server, like again, like described for the SKA, where you could just put a server in an instrument hut. In this case, we're going into a hut in Colorado, uh, precisely when there's a wonderful rainbow in the background, and uh, sliding that in and processing the data in a rack mounted blade, right, that has a GPU. But other times it needs to sit outside. And that previous picture showed this node, which has a GPU, but it's a small GPU. It's one of the NVIDIA Jetson series. And then there's a power supply and power of Ethernet and all of the necessary components so that this, which is relatively small, you know, it's uh, something that somebody can carry. We'll see a picture of it later, can be put outside and measured directly and use it to uh, process data directly. Uh, so to how this uh, data flows from our nodes, whether it's a blade or it's an outdoor node, we call it a wild sage node, uh, we build on the standard software stack. Now, the, one of the interesting modifications to what we need to do for a large science, science experiment is if everyone is running and designing their own software-defined sensor. One scientist wants to measure uh, bat calls in the ultrasonic uh, range, or someone else wants to understand and look at for wildfire. We now need a new kind of scheduler. It's not a batch scheduler that waits for every job to complete, but it has to be able to run based on goals and priorities. 
So maybe the wildfire uh, sensor is more important at a certain time than uh, detecting bats, right? Or looking at bird song. And so uh, that is a special kind of, of uh, multi-tenant uh, goal-based scheduler. And then all of that data gets pushed out, uh, pushed up to a, a uh, cloud service uh, that we run that includes a way to store all the data, query all the data, and then uh, make it available via FAIR uh, uh, practices. So this is an example of all of the applications that are currently running and working uh, on, uh, on our platform. So you can go to portal.sagecontinuum.org uh, um, and you can see code that lets you do water detection or monitor birds or uh, count objects using the latest uh, uh, computer vision, like you know whether you see a person or a car or a tree or a bird, uh, understanding cloud motion for atmospheric science, uh, wildfire as, as discussed. And so here's a very short video um, showing one of these nodes being put up in the city of Chicago. So we have nodes now distributed across the United States, and some uh, are in Australia as well. And uh, it takes a, uh, a uh, transportation team. Uh, this is from the Chicago Department of Transportation. These are the regular people who put up uh, uh, holiday decorations or new uh, uh, computing pieces or, or new cameras or uh uh, cell phone infrastructure. And so they move their truck into place and they hoist it up and it straps on with a couple metal straps. This is a, a special unit that had extra cameras to get a stereo view of a green space. And they're doing uh, flood uh, remediation. They're fixing some of the flooding that happens. And so we're monitoring the water levels and how it improves, how much improvement will we get with that flood uh, in, uh, remediation. Now, students have been very active in this, and there's a lot of opportunity for great new research. So this research was done originally at Northern Illinois University. It's a fantastic project where uh, one of the cameras is looking down at a crosswalk where the students walk to class uh, from between buildings. And as I mentioned, one of the goals here is to preserve privacy. So the students can not track who is crossing, but rather how are they crossing and what uh, paths do they take? Do they use the uh, crosswalk correctly? Were there, is there, are there dangers? Should they change how uh, the uh, signaling, uh, maybe change the layout of the intersection? So in this case, the red and blue lines represent pedestrians crossing in one direction or pedestrians crossing in the other. And you can see that uh, there are a variety of, of methods that, uh, that the pedestrians take. These are mostly students, sometimes taking the crosswalk, sometimes going up a block, or sometimes just going diagonally. And again, we can get live stats on this uh, throughout the day, uh, and they've made a portal that shows you know, how the crosswalk is being used. So this is just a simple example of a student project using this kind of infrastructure where they can send the application out to the edge process in real time and send only the results back. Uh, another example is simply analyzing clouds. Now we have names, if you look up at the sky, we have names for what kinds of clouds uh, scientists might see, but uh, being able to understand the cloud motion vector, understand exactly how clouds are moving in a particular area, and then using multiple cameras, 10, 20, 30 cameras to make a large, under a picture of what's happening is much uh, um, more effective than a sort of uh, wait every 15 minutes for a uh, satellite image, right? Which also measures only the top and not from the bottom. So this gives us a way to measure from the bottom. We also then can use self, self supervised, self learning uh, algorithms at the edge to categorize what kind of clouds we're seeing, and then to use that with a LIDAR and process and understand uh, what's happening. How, how, uh, uh, how tall are the clouds? At what levels do you see those clouds? So this is de deployed out in Oklahoma uh, doing this measurement, and we will see many more of these deployed around the United States. Um, I mentioned uh, bird diversity. This is a great example. So I'm sure you're familiar with uh, um, the 
uh, Cornell uh, ornithologists. Uh, these are uh, a place in the uh, United States where some of the best research on birds and bird species and uh, um, what's happening in the environment. Uh, and they have developed a model that you can load on your phone uh, then there's an app called Merlin, and that model, you can sit outside, and I've, I've done it in Africa before, I've done it in the United States, you can sit outside and you can listen with your phone and it will tell you what bird you're hearing, like what the species is. So we can take that model and from that research that they've done, where they've done all the training, we can ship that model out to the edge. Again, it's a software defined sensor. And here we've shipped it out to a node that's sitting at a prairie near Chicago. And we can look through and see what kind of birds we are hearing throughout the day and why, right? Uh, you know, during the during several months. We also have put it at an arboretum, uh, which is a large park that is uh, hosting very, a variety of tree species. And we can understand near the road and farther away from the road, what kind of bird species and what diversity do we have? A very simple uh, um, uh, use of this kind of technology is also just measuring uh, water and snow based on sticks uh, in the ground. Now, um, you know, you might, <laughs> you're, it's, it's uh, uh, kind of funny to, to sort of think about how normally these sticks are measured by a human, meaning a grad student, uh, once a week or at some frequency going out to a site and looking at the depth of the water or the depth of the snow and writing it in a journal and then going back and entering it online. But again, using computer algorithms that we ship out to the edge, so we run it in the device out uh, on the GPU, we can automatically segment, find these sticks, segment those sticks, and then calculate how long, how tall they are, and eventually get to a, uh, a, a an automated measurement that tells us how deep the water is or how deep the snow is. And so that's a very useful thing uh, as we divide uh, and, and distribute sensors around the country, especially in flood prone areas, to be able to measure a gradient of water uh, uh, moving up or down across bridges. And it works anywhere where you can have a, a graduated uh, mark against uh, a visual indication, right? Uh, similarly, we can do the same thing by looking at surface water detection. This is a park in, uh, in, in Chicago and understanding how it floods and then building models for that is what the local uh, park department would like to do. Traffic monitoring, of course, is another uh, example of this. And uh, in this particular case, this is an expansion project at o our airport in Chicago called O'Hare. And uh, the project would like to understand the, the vehicle types. So most uh, traffic monitoring systems are measuring what's called occupancy, how much of the, of the lane is occupied by vehicles, but they would like to understand sort of taxis and uh, delivery trucks and how can they modify traffic around the airport uh, to reduce congestion. Uh, I mentioned earlier wildfire, and this is one of the nodes, and uh, it was mounted on a tower here. I'm going to show a quick video of that. Um, but we were also able to mount on the tower to, uh, during a um, prescribed burn an infrared camera. And the infrared camera then gives us what is real smoke, which we can yet then use AI to train the regular uh, 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 optical vision camera uh, for what is smoke. So in this case, you can see this is hot and we can look over here and work out, okay, this is real smoke as opposed to cloud. And so uh, I'll just show a few seconds of this. Uh, this is the, in Kansas, uh, our node is set up here on this tower. We have three nodes and the infrared. And uh, here is our thermal camera. It's, can't quite see it uh, over here. And then down here are our three nodes, which are looking at uh, and measuring bird song. Uh, it's measuring particulates in the air, uh, measuring uh, the clouds, uh, measuring wind uh, and other things. And as we look here, uh, we'll get to the uh, uh, infrared and the burn. So the uh, patches here are maintained by the university. Uh, and the this is one of the only 
extremely pristine prairies uh, in the United States. And uh, the Native Americans uh, uh, burned these areas regularly in order to improve them. Uh, and so that tradition continues. And here we see uh, the infrared camera versus the IR or versus the visible camera. And again, we can use this then to do automatic training of the data, right? So we can train a new model. And we've also just started a project with uh, um, the Native American tribe uh, Ojibwe. This is up in Wisconsin. And one of the important sentinel species for them is wild rice. And they would like to understand uh, how climate change is moving where wild rice is living and uh, what's happening to the water uh, in that regard. We have a number of nodes uh, around the United States, as I said, and in uh, um, Australia as well. And uh, um, this is a portal view. So you can, as I mentioned, you can get on and you can look directly at what the nodes are measuring, what algorithms are being run at this instant. Uh, and, and look at directly at the data. Uh, we also have set up a, a student kit that is still under development, but the students built a version that uses this, the uh, NVIDIA Nano, which is a very small several hundred dollar uh, uh, system and can attach their own sensors and then write code for the edge as a classroom project. So that kind of code that you might write, whether that's uh, visual or audio or infrared or something else, can be run directly on one of these smaller nodes, just using the same software stack, but simply not as fast. And uh, I thought I would put up here on the screen just examples of what students are coming and saying, this is the kind of, of area we'd like to explore. So we have folks who are calculating biodiversity, not just birds, but insects, everything, right? Uh, what can we do to calculate biodiversity of a site uh, using audio or measuring bats or uh, classifying a wildfire uh, and water flow or uh, how um, uh, one, another example in the city is how are those bikes and shared bikes used? Um, can we understand how well, how do people use uh, helmets when they use shared bikes? Do they use helmets or do they only use a helmet when they're using their private bike? Um, we also have uh, teams who want to understand ice and ice thickness as it forms on structures. Uh, so there's a lot of places where uh, research is um, done. Can I interrupt you? Just say you have five minutes more. Yes, well, I'm at the last slide, so that's perfect. So, uh, um, yeah, so if you have questions, uh, um, here are some links, but we'll we'll make sure that the slides are available. Um, we encourage people to work with us to develop codes for the edge, or of course, even to deploy nodes. And I, I uh, got to meet several uh, folks uh, um, from South Africa who, are working in the in uh, environmental science areas, and I think this is a place where we might be able to collaborate and work together. So, with that, I'll uh, I'll stop sharing, and uh, and uh, we can do some questions. Okay, thank you very much, Pete. And please give him a round of applause. It's a very interesting presentation. I'm sure there are questions. Who's going to start us off? Questions, please. Um, I'll stand here out of the way of the camera. Thanks for a very interesting presentation. Uh, my mind is boggling as to how you provide power to these remote sites, because that's always a big challenge here in South Africa with, uh, you know, uh, potential uh, theft and vandalism. Um, maybe not a reality there, but maybe it is. I'd love to know how you power the, the remote sites. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. It's a it's a very good question, um, and there are you know there are always challenges. So I'll, you know that picture of the node going up in the city of Chicago. When we first talked to the people in Chicago and asked them, you know, how do we do this? They said our ideal would be that it would be 
you know, closer to ground level, right? So you could so you could see what's happening from a pedestrian's view. Of course, they told us, uh, no, in Chicago, you need to be at least a hockey stick height away from a pedestrian. It's got to be up uh, 20 feet or so. So uh, we reduce uh, uh, damage and vandalism. So there are places where we have to work at that. We have a very remote site in Montana that there is no cell phone coverage and there's a Starlink uh, uh, terminal. I have one in my, my uh, room here uh, in the back. Um, and so that's how we get data. Uh, that uh, places where we need power, we have to install solar panels. And uh, um, luckily our, our system is pretty low power, right? So we're using a, a lightweight NVIDIA processor. We can get by with, you know, sort of the continual running power is maybe 60 watts would be high. Uh, we can go as low as maybe 30 watts. Uh, and so uh, it is possible to use solar in very remote places, but we're also happy that some of the places we're installing, um, most of the places have power, especially in those towers, they have uh, generation uh, for for power. Networking is a continual problem, as you might imagine. Thank you. Next question. Interesting. No more questions. So maybe I could actually um, ask one or two of my own. Um, I see you have uh, put up the cost of a of a, a sage node, I think that's what it's called, yeah, um, at about $300. Um, I think in the African context, that's still a bit pricey for, for most of our applications. Um, are there any uh, plans to get it lower than that? Yeah, so the $300 is really the, the I'd say, the student kit, you know, that you could put in a box, um, and we have some you know, hard shell boxes uh, for, for students uh, exploring that. Um, it's also possible to do something even cheaper. The, the difficulty is um, uh, what kind of processing you could do at the edge. So, you know, a standard Raspberry Pi, you know, uh, built sort of system, again, the software stack would work on that, uh, but you would get uh, a little bit less fidelity in what you might be able to measure and how quickly you might be able to measure it. Uh, there are also um, things that we've been doing with IoT devices, but those then are, I'll say, uh, uh, not so smart, right? They're measuring one thing, you know, 15 seconds later, they measure another thing, whether it's temperature, pressure, humidity, soil moisture, and they report back. Uh, our, our real interest from a research perspective is being able to measure those things that you can't otherwise measure. And that really takes things like audio or camera or, or RF or other things. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Are there any other questions from the audience? Okay. It's, it's... And it's, my question is regarding the ethics. Uh, have you ever run into any ethical considerations or challenges as you kind of measure this uh, uh, objects around the states? Are there any ethical considerations? Thank you. There, there are, it's a very good question. So when we first started this partnership with Chicago, we had listening sessions with uh, local community groups and uh, we sat and talked with them, you know, what are you concerned about? What would you like to make sure is, uh, is uh, adhered to? What rules would you like? And uh, they're very honest in saying they want their environment to be safe uh, of, in an environmental way. We're not, we don't do any what we would call law enforcement. So we're not measuring, uh, uh, you know, people or places uh, for law enforcement purposes, only environmental. And people are very interested in what's my air quality? Uh, what kind of, uh, is there construction noise, you know, late at the night, late at night when there shouldn't be? And so the, the, the people of the cities uh, really want this information. And as long as the policy is completely open, so the policy is published, what the algorithms are doing is open. Everyone can see the, in fact, the source code is open. 
um, everyone can see what's happening. Uh, there are um, uh, other issues with respect to when we put nodes in remote places and uh, um, what we can see or how to report that. But again, being with a very open process of first doing sort of town hall meetings and letting people know what the science is, those, uh, those uh, worries seem to uh, uh, be much easier. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just as a follow-up, um, you did mention the fact that people are able to code for the platform. So um, does this mean you allow, for example, as I mean, we have a student project application. The student could write some code in uh, Python or something similar and upload it, but I expect it will have to be probably allowed to be deployed on the system. Just to yeah, cater yeah, that, for the yeah. story of ethics. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. Um, and this is the problem with what we'll call, you know, sort of black box AI, right? So we do allow uh, students to, and we want students to write code. We put them in, I'll say the sandbox, uh, you know, in nodes that are deployed locally that we can control and understand and look at the data and the, the uh, algorithms uh, before they're deployed at remote sites. Uh, but it does take a, a, uh, a sort of an inspection in the same way that, you know, Apple or Google look at what goes on their Apple store or their Play store before it goes on your phone to make sure that nothing, you know, incorrect is going to the phone. We have to do the same thing to make sure that nothing incorrect is going out to the nodes that would measure something that isn't uh, the appropriate to be measured. Okay, thank you very much. I believe you had your email address on the slides. Um, I'm sure we'll definitely be getting in touch because we do have several student projects that are looking at um, using IoT sensors for environmental monitoring and AI on the edge as well. So we thank you very much, Pete. And then um, I want to also thank the audience for participating today. I believe there are no more speakers. So I want to thank you all for participating and um, wish you happy um, conference, uh, stay at the conference. Thank you.